Cardozo here to speak. Uh, I'm just going to speak a few words about Rabbi Cardozo and then let him take over. Rabbi Cardozo, Rabbi Dr. Nathan Lopez Cardozo, is the founder and dean of the David Cardozo Academy and the Beit Midrash of Avraham Avinu in Yerushalayim. A sought-after lecturer on the interna international stage for both Jewish and non-Jewish audiences, Rabbi Cardozo is the author of 13 books and numerous articles in both English and Hebrew. Rabbi Cardozo heads a think tank focused on finding new halachic and philosophical approaches to dealing with the crisis of religion and identity amongst Jews and the Jewish state of Israel. Hailing from the Netherlands, Rabbi Cardozo is known for his original and often fearlessly controversial insights into Judaism. His ideas are widely debated on an international level on social media, blogs, books, and other forums. His latest book, Jewish Law as Rebellion, discusses hot topics such as same-sex marriage, conversion, and religion in the state of Israel and presents a critical analysis and explanation of the application of halakha. Rabbi Cardozo will be sticking around at the end of this evening to sign books, and the books will be for sale if anybody's interested. And without further ado, I give you Rabbi Cardozo. Thank you very much. Of course, everyone. Ilana is my right-hand woman. <laughs> She is our marketing director, and I owe her a lot, and I also owe her this evening. She is the one who put this together, so thank you very much, Ilana. I also want to thank uh, the Kehillah here, Shari Yonah Menachem, and also Kehillat Lechun Ranana, for making this possible, so toda to, to all of you. I also want to thank Michael Pomerantz, who is outside selling the books, a good friend of mine. And I also want to mention that all the papers on the right side of the tables over there, you can take without any charge. And here, okay. And also, uh, in front of you over here are sheets, which in case, chas shalom, you don't get my socks to ponder every week, <laughs> please fill in your name and very carefully your email address, because one little dot and it won't arrive. So uh, please do so, and uh, this is also without any charge, and I just hope that you will enjoy it. I write every Thursday already for I don't know how many years, uh, mainly about topics which gets me into trouble. <laughs> uh, that is exactly what I actually want to do with my life. Perhaps the best way to uh, start this lecture and introduce this book is by telling you that several months ago I was invited to give, to give the keynote lecture in Amsterdam, which is the place where I was born, for the 275th anniversary of the rabbinical seminar in Amsterdam. That's a very old institution. It's produced most of the Dutch rabbis over the years and uh, they asked me if I could give the keynote lecture there. And the request was that I would speak about the future of orthodoxy. And they gave me half an hour. <laughs> <laughs> and I said to them uh, that that is much too much. <laughs> <laughs> because really, I could handle this within one minute. Seriously, this may sound a little off and radical, but that is no doubt my intention. I said to a group, this was also for the University of Amsterdam, that I do not believe that orthodoxy as it is today has any future whatsoever. And then I sat down and I said, thank you very much. <laughs> But obviously I did not get away with that, I had to explain myself. And I said that I indeed believe, although I consider myself to be an orthodox Jew, also the word orthodoxy is the last word to use in the case of the Jewish tradition. It's basically a word which was invented after the reform community came into existence. I still believe that it is true to say that orthodoxy has, over the years, especially after the Shoah, committed suicide. For serious reasons and for very 
sad reasons. And that is that it was not able to hold out and to continue the Jewish tradition after such an incredible, terrible event as the Shoah. Everything has changed because of the Shoah. The questions about Emuna, about Bitachon, about belief in God, belief in the Torah changed. After all, how could a God ever allow this to happen? And that requires new thinking within the Jewish tradition. God forbid not to leave it. That's the last thing what we should do. But it definitely challenges us in many different ways. Now, I don't mind once to speak about this in this group, but this is not the topic of tonight, but it is obviously related to it. But what I really want to focus on tonight is the miserable situation, especially in the state of Israel, this beautiful country here in which we live. I live here already for nearly 45 years. Sorry, I never lost my Dutch accent, but it can't be helped. People told me I shouldn't lose it, so that makes it even more difficult. Uh, that here in the state of Israel, the situation about religiosity, about being religious, and above all about halakha, Jewish law, for a lack of a better translation, has been terribly miserable. And halakha has become stagnant. It was not, for whatever reasons we shall see, able to move on as it should have been. And therefore, and you all know as much about it as I do, we are now in great difficulties on all sorts of different levels when it comes to the application of Jewish law of halakha to a radically new condition of the Jewish people, and that is the state of Israel, in which we, Baruch Hashem, happen to live. I just mentioned a few issues here, and they are nothing more than simanim of what actually is going on, and which I don't think people really realize properly, and definitely not within the religious community. Whether it is ultra-Orthodox, Haredi, or Dati Umi, modern Orthodox, it doesn't really make too much of a difference. We have here in this country a majority of Jews who are not committed, at least not fully, to the Jewish tradition. Although there are changes taking place for the good, so it seems, from the statistics we get, more and more people want to know about what it means to be Jewish, also in religious terms. If you go to Tel Aviv today, where I used to run for many years in Ramat, uh, uh, Ramat Gan, a uh, outreach program, if today you would walk around there, you see many more kipot, you see many more people somehow related to the Jewish tradition, which you didn't see years ago. The main reason for that is that people realize more and more, what are we doing in this country, if not for the fact that we are Jewish? Not Israeli, but Jewish. Not that I want to undermine the movement and the meaning of Israelihood, but Jewish is 4,000 years old. Israeli is not even 100 years old, and we cannot forget that. But we have here a big problem, which we discuss every second week in the Knesset and beyond that, and that is, what are we going to do about the Jewish identity of this state? If on one side we want to be a democracy, which is the only option we have, and on the other side we want this Jewish tradition to play a major role in this democracy. And that is far from easy. Can they go together, yes or no? And we are debating this since the days of 1948. That's the reason why we have no basic law in this country, because we still haven't made up our mind what we really want with all that. So that is the Jewish tradition versus democracy. And then when you look into the pratim, into the details, I don't have to tell you how many there are. The question about Haredi soldiers in the army, yes or no. The question about building a, a, or repairing a railroad, Tel Aviv, Yerushalayim, or in Tel Aviv, which needs to be done on Shabbat, 
because otherwise it will be chaotic what will happen in the weekdays and it will undermine the finances of the state of Israel. So we are told. Then we have 400,000 people walking around here in this country who are from a Jewish background, mainly Russian, but are halakhically not Jewish. They serve in the army, they feel Jewish, they want to be Jewish, but there's one thing they don't want, at least the majority of them. They don't want to commit to a full observant life for all sorts of different reasons, or too hard, or they're not motivated enough. And we do know quite well that if we don't deal with that problem, then in a matter of time there will be many more. Why? Because the next generation will then marry these people, and again we will have non-halachic Jews, as I call them, for a lack of a better word, walking around in this country, and that is definitely not very healthy. But, and I'm going to be very critical, our chief rabbinate, with all respect, is not prepared to handle this case the way as it needs to be handled. Then we have the status of women. Can they serve in a bait team in a rabbinical court? Can they give evidence in a rabbinical court? And according to the old tradition, they cannot. Can that be changed? Should that be changed? Is it not highly necessary that women have a say when any kind of big mishpat or big deen will decide on matters of life or death or for that reason of life, how people are able to continue with their lives without women sitting there and giving their understanding of this case, which at this moment is not yet possible. I don't have to tell you about the Aguna problem, which is a scandal of the first order, and therefore the Mamser problem, which I don't have to explain to you what that is. And then we get to the problem of a get. When is a get cashier? When it is not cashier? We just had a case about a year ago that a bait dean in Safat came up with a very important ruling allowing a woman to get remarried and getting the get not from her husband because he was incapable of doing so. He was out of conscious. And giving that get in his name, which then was nearly overruled by the chief rabbis, with all respect. To the end, the scandal was that the Beit Mishpat, the secular Beit Mishpat, had to come up and tell the rabbis not to interfere in this matter and leave it for what it was. The Chilul Hashem was unbelievable. And then we have another problem, by the way, which I'm not sure you are aware of so much, but there is a lot of that, and that is the fact that there is a lot of discrimination going on today within the religious community towards Gentiles. I'm not only speaking about the Arab population, which is one issue, which is a political issue, but in general, the way how we look down on the non-Jewish world, and we really see them as secondary citizens of this world because we Jews are the real ones. It creates enormous problems on all sorts of different levels. Little is done about all this. There are a few posky, mainly young people, who are now picking up on this and trying to understand that this needs to be changed, that the official mainstream orthodox world is not at all responding to that. And let us not make a mistake, it is not only the ultra-orthodox, it also happens in the mainstream, datil umi world, or modern orthodox world, where very little of that is being done. You know, in America at the moment, there is this whole open orthodoxy, I won't go into the details now, trying to do something about it, and all the problems which come about because of it, against it, in favor of it, and so on. I'm very involved in all these matters, but there's no time to discuss that. But the main <coughs> problem here, and that is what my book is all about, is that the halakha indeed became stagnant already for quite a few years, and that we are now overwhelmed, overwhelmed with a lot of books. I've never seen so many books in my lifetime being written about halakha. Mm -hmm. It started with Shemirat Shabbat of Rav Neubert. I suppose you all know that book, it became very famous. Then it goes on to Twilat Kelim, a book like this about Twilat Kelim. 
Then another book like that about Siniut, how do you have to dress? And then it is about Muktze, what you're allowed to touch or move on Shabbat, yes or no. And it continues to flow more and more of these books, which, by the way, convinces me of the fact that not one of our grandparents ever was religious because <laughs> most of this they did not know. <laughs> but the question is, is this good or is this bad? One of the main issues here is, is that the music of the Jewish tradition is completely irrelevant in these books, with all respect to the authors who wrote it. That is to say, if you don't explain the spirit, the spirituality, what I call the music of the Jewish tradition behind all this, and why we do all these things, and why life is not always so easy as an Orthodox Jew, unless we explain it in a way that it really not only makes sense, but that it speaks to our soul, so why are we complaining when our grandchildren or children walk out of the Jewish <laughs> tradition, they go off, as it says in English, off the derg, right? <coughs> and then we are terribly upset about this, <coughs> while in fact we have created that situation ourselves, because if I would be in their situation, I probably also would walk out. Why? Because not one of these books really relates to the big question, and that is, what does it mean to be religious? And what does it mean to be Jewish? That is completely left out of this whole discussion. And therefore, from one point of view, we are, and I'm also very pleased that there has never been so much Torah learning today going on in the Jewish world since the last 2000 years as is going on now. But the question is, is everything healthy over there? Is everything going in the way as it should go? Or are we in for a major disaster, which I'm very afraid of, to be very honest, that at a certain moment, lots of young people will say, we won't buy it anymore. We won't get indoctrinated by all this, unless you come up with a whole different way of looking to why you want us to be observant. And very little, I'm not saying not at all, but very little has been done or is being done about this, even at this very moment. Also, things are getting a little better. I can put this all in one sentence. The halakha gets only recycled. It does not get processed. It gets recycled. What we are doing in all these books is basically taking all the information of the last 2,000 years, putting it in an orderly way within these books, take Shemirat Shabbat, a fantastic example of this, <coughs> one, two, three, four, Mesudar, Le Gamre, right? But it's all recycling. There is no processing this. There's no moving forward. There's no thinking in new terms in according to the times in which we live. And what I personally believe, the halakha definitely not only would like to happen, happen but suggests to happen, and we have completely and totally ignored it by doing away with anything which stands in the way of the recycling kind of tradition in which we find ourselves at this moment. <coughs> Processing, thinking about what we are doing, how are we developing this, specifically in relationship to the State of Israel, is more or less not being touched on. Many halachists, with all respect, are dead scared of thinking creatively. Because, as we all know, it is much easier to stay put and to go by the common place and to say, okay, this is what we have, and don't disturb me, and don't make me uncomfortable, and don't move me out of the comfort zone in which I happen to live. I live my religious life, I go to shul, I make kiddush, I eat kosher, I say a dwar Torah at the table and so on, but they must speak. Why do you want anything more from me? The only trouble is that our children will no doubt say, that's not enough for us, because we want really to know what this is all about, and if you can't tell us what it is, so why should we commit ourselves to that? And then we have in this country an enormous problem, and it is that everybody, as probably nearly all of you or many of you have been, we have served in the army, which is far from an easy matter, 
I beat myself in the <coughs> army. And then you're asking yourself, and I've had this many times happening to me while I was serving in the army, people asking me, why actually do we need to go and fight for the state of Israel? If I go to California, life is much easier. <laughs> if I go to Europe, life is much easier. What is this all about? And then the majority of them do not know the answer. I tell you, I've spoken more about these matters in the army than actually I was ever fighting. Because this was much more crucial. The Mafak team who used to come up to me and say, so explain us, what is this all about? Why are you so crazy about these, all these halachot? And we made them crazy about it because we wanted Shachet, we wanted Mincha, we wanted Marif. I was at the time uh, with a whole group of uh, Ger Hasidim, by the way, in the army. They are the only ones who do go into the army, by the way. And uh, they wanted to have Klat Kosher. Klat Kosher is not part of the army regulation. It has to be kosher. But then anyway, all of that came out when they started to ask, why is this so important? And I felt it my task, because I'm involved in this, to try to explain them to my best cap capacity, ability, why it, this is so incredibly important. If we do away with the Jewish tradition in the state of Israel, I dare to say that in a matter of time, the state of Israel will no longer exist. But if we continue to do what we are doing now, I'm also not so sure anymore, unless we start creatively thinking about what does the halakha now require from us, living in totally different conditions than we have done for the last 2,000 years, when we were living in Europe, or for that reason in uh, Morocco, or for that reason in so many other places like the USA. We don't want to stretch our brains. We don't want to be troubled. We want just to live in commonplace <coughs> contentment. And I'm going to mention here a great man with whom I do not agree, but he was no doubt a great man. If you are from England, you know who I'm speaking about, Louis Jacobs. Some of you probably will remember this very controversial figure, who was, it, by the way, a tremendous Talmud Chacham, who once wrote the following words. I quote, who wants a life of contentment? Religions throughout the ages used to comfort the troubled. But now we should use it to trouble the comfortable. <laughs> <laughs> and that is exactly right. Now we have to realize that this attitude of living comfortable and using the Jewish tradition to make that to happen <coughs> is not any longer going to work. And by the way, this is not only true about the orthodox movement, it is true about the reform movement, it is true about the conservative movement. In my opinion, they're all completely missing the point. And definitely, that's also true about the secular world of Israelis. I don't know how many really are secular, by the way, and I think it is much less than we think. But the fact is that that question about being comfortable with your life and not wanting to be wait, waiting up, wakened up and to be sad, you better start thinking about all this seriously. We are in major trouble. And that's the reason why I'm saying that orthodoxy, <coughs> but I could say that it's about the conservative movement and the reform movement as well, we basically sold out. The only people who did not sell out, strangely enough, are the Haredi. I live today, I live in Bayt Vegan, Yerushalayim, which at the time, 40 years ago, when I came on Aliyah, was a very mixed crowd there. Dati Lumi, a little bit ultra-Orthodox, many Lodati, you know, I don't like these terminologies, but just for the sake of argument. Now, today, it is completely Haredi. If they know what I think about the Jewish tradition, <laughs> they would never give me an aliyah anymore and I would be thrown out of the Bet Knesset. <laughs> this is more serious than you think. <laughs> I have already been told by one or two shuls that I'm no longer allowed to speak there for the very reasons you understand, and that is that I challenge this whole approach. I don't care less, to be quite honest, but it's a bad sign. It's not what it should be. The Haredim have one thing which is 
unbelievable and which I greatly respect. Passion. Passion for the Jewish tradition. With all the problems which go along with that in the way how they express them. We all know about this. But they are prepared to give up their lives for the Jewish tradition. There's only one problem about it. It is the wrong Jewish tradition. <laughs> but it definitely is something which we should take notice of and be impressed by that people sometimes, I know what I'm speaking about because I live among them and I learned in Yeshivot Haredeot for many, many years, 12 years together. I learned in Gateshead in England. Then afterwards I learned another four years in the Mirror Yeshiva. And then I decided that that is no longer the world anymore I really could commit myself to, but the learning has been outstanding and I'm extremely thankful for that. My teachers were outstanding, very fine people, the Rosh Yeshivot at the time. But the world looks different than what I think it really is. The problem is the following. What is halakha? What is the matara? What is the purpose of halakha? Now, there's a lot of discussion about that alone within the Jewish tradition. And I'm only going to give you my interpretation, and then you understand why this relates to the book I just published. I believe that the halakha, at the moment at least, its major purpose is to disturb to make us feel uncomfortable, to protest, to rebel against what? what? Against all the way in which, and I include myself in this as well, in the way how we have projected our Jewish tradition in this comfortable, commonplace, mainstream way, which does not allow anybody to think on his own, to think independent, and just to do what everybody else does <coughs> because we need to live in conformity. Now, conformity no doubt plays a role within the halachic system. I come to that in a moment. But to say that that is what the Jewish tradition is all about, in my opinion, is completely missing the boat. Let's go back for a moment to the Chumash, which we read every week here in Bet Knesset. What is this text? I'll tell you what it is. It is a rebellious text. It is a protesting text. It is a text which is not prepared to go along with whatever people at the time when it was given, or even today, believe is important and in the center of their lives. It is a rebellious text because it does away with what we can call radical heresies of the past. In the olden days, it was Abu Dazara, idol worship. It was uh, abomination, and it is still today immorality. Worship of man. I can continue with a long list of all the different things which are obviously wrong, and if you look carefully and you read between the lines of the Torah and the whole halachic system afterwards, then you see clearly what this is all about. Rebellion. I don't know if you saw, and there was a documentary made about my life, uh, which also speaks about this very thing, rebellion. That is the whole need to stand out and to stand up, and if necessary, have war with a community, or better, with a condition in which mankind lives itself its way now, which is <laughs> not getting us anywhere, does not wake us up, and only puts us asleep. Complacency all around. I'm speaking about the Dati world. We are speaking about this beautiful Yiddish word, frumkeit. This is the worst word we can ever use because it is exactly that thing. You need to be frum. I always say I'm no longer frum, I'm trying to be a little religious. <laughs> what is this frumkeit? It is a certain form of Abu Dazara itself. You need to belong to the world of Frumkeit. There's a lot of insensitivity. There's a lot of conformity for the sake of conformity. I want to believe, belong to this community, and therefore I have to do this. I have to dress like that. I have to have this kind of kippah. 
don't think I'm only speaking about the old orthodox. It happens everywhere. It happens also in the secular community. Also, there is a lot of indoctrination taking place, just as much as there's indoctrination taking place in our own communities, the religious communities. What is the purpose of halakha? What is the purpose of being religious? Now, let me tell you something very interesting and very disturbing. I get nearly every Friday night Bachure Yeshiva at my Friday night table. They are all from the ultra-Orthodox world, and many of them are also from the Dertile Umi world. And I ask, and that's perhaps not fair, in the middle of the conversation I say to them, tell me something, how long have you learned in Yeshiva? Five years, six years, wow. How many Masechtot did you learn? Well, Baba Kama, Baba Metziya, Baba Batra, Sam Hedri, phew, very impressive. Now I'm going to ask you one question. What would you answer when a religious non-Jew or a non-religious non-Jew or a non-religious Jew will ask you one question? Why are you religious? What would you answer? My friends, 99% of all my guests do not know how to answer that question. They're shocked that they're being asked that question. And they say to me, we never spoke about this. And I say to them, after four, five, six years learning yeshiva, being through half of Shas, of the Talmud, you still don't know how to give some kind of an answer to the question why you are living a religious life. Don't you think there's something very wrong about this? The most basic thing of human life is that there is meaning to life, that there is purpose to life, at least from a religious perspective, and you're not able even to respond to that. You're not able to say anything about it, and you're taken back by it. And the answer is, and that is true, our Roshi Yeshivot never spoke about it. Because we were being told that we have to learn Gemara with Rashi and Tosafot and with all the other commentators. <coughs> and then I have as I did, I went to some of the Rosh Hashivot and I asked them, what would you say? <laughs> and the answer was, they were totally shocked. They didn't know. Halavai that I know what they know in Talmud. But they couldn't answer that question. So I challenged them and I said to them, if that's the case, so what kind of message are you sending to your Talmudim? <coughs> What's going on over here? Sometimes you see that the women who went to the seminars know more about this than the men who have been learning in yeshiva for many years. And I know quite a few rabbis, if I would ask them today, with all respect, that question, they would not know what to answer. But they can tell me actually everything about Shemitah. They can tell me anything about any diuk into the halachot of Shabbat. But if I ask them about why they are religious, they are silent. That is an enormous tragedy. Contentment, stagnation, and not realizing that life only is able to continue to be meaningful when it constantly moves, when it grows. When it fails to grow, then at a the moment later, it will definitely die. And I'm terribly, terribly worried that that is not happening at this moment with the Orthodox world. Dying, if not that it is perhaps already dead. If human beings don't learn to live with passion, if they don't learn to live with a feeling like what I call the seasons of their soul, of constantly relating to what is happening in the neshama of the human being, then they are not able to renew themselves, then they fall into boredom, and there is a lot of boredom taking place within the religious community. I see that in my own shul where I go, which is a datilo yomi shul, where half the community is asleep while they are davening. And I can't say that I am not guilty of that either. 
because it is little inspirational what happens. People are reading papers, little, you know, the, all these little things which come out here of Shabbat, everybody's reading it. They're no longer listening anymore to what actually the Torah is trying to tell us. A protesting, rebelling text, they don't listen to it. This is, as we believe, and as I believe, Torah min shamayim, it is Torah from heaven, the word of God, and you're falling asleep. If anything, you should faint because of the enormous power of this particular text. And therefore we get the dehumanization, not just of the religious Jew, but of the whole meaning of what it means to be human. It happens everywhere. It happens perhaps worse outside the religious community. I'm not sure if that's true, by the way. But it's happening everywhere. In the Gentile world, as much. They have exactly the same problem as we have. Churches, I sometimes have something to do with the people who are running these places, or I teach them, I hear the same story over and over again. But we as Jews, who after all, the forerunners of all this, we are the initiators of this whole way of living a life in the, let's say, and having an encounter with God, we somehow have lost the dinner ourselves as well. Everything got streamlined, and then suddenly I look in the top. I am a Baal Teshuvah. I don't know what that means, but that's what they tell me I am. So I started all this much later in life. And I remember that for the first time I opened up a Talmud, I couldn't read a word of it. Definitely not Hebrew and definitely not Aramaic. So what did I do? There was in my days, there was a German translation of the Gemara. There was nearly no Perush on it, but it was just a translation. And I was metaphoring, you know, I was going through this, having a look here, having a look there. And I saw an unbelievable world which I didn't even grasp at the time because you can only really read this properly in the original text in Aramaic and in Hebrew. You know what the Talmud really is? It is an encyclopedia of the Jewish tradition with one problem. It hasn't got an A, B, C, D. It is complete chaotic. There is complete chaos. Bilbu in the Talmud. Everything comes up suddenly out of nowhere land, moves to something else which you did not expect, then goes back to the discussion again. It is a complete balagon. And that is its power. Because all the sunlight, the sundering, the lightning, the sunshine, the fantastic stories, the dreams, the art, the music, I would even say you can find classic music there and jazz at the same time. It is all there. It's a huge symphony created by about 400 Chachamim, 400 sages, who lived within about a period of 400 years. And there's one thing what they do. Disagree. Disagree. And therefore they are fighting for their lives. And not always so polite either. But the most interesting thing about this is that these 400 sages who lived for 400 years are being presented within the Talmud if they lived next to each other. They knew each other. They spoke together. They argued together. While we know that nothing of that ever happened because they lived hundreds of years away from each other. But what does the editors of the Talmud do? That's absolutely remarkable. And there is no other place in the world where this happens, no literature, where the rabbis who wrote the Talmud put all these rabbis together, put them around the table, and have them discuss all sorts of things which we know they never discussed because they never lived in the same age. But why did they do that? It's because they realized a very important thing. It has got nothing to do in the time in which you live. It is the ideas, the ideology, the concepts behind that which is so important and therefore they make them into neighbors sitting next to each other and disagreeing 
to the point that you get dizzy. Let me tell you something. In the Talmud, we discuss damages, legal issues, insurance, administration of justice. And then you turn the page, which I did in my German translation, and I see the next few mishpatim, the next few sentences in Latin and not in German. Now, I happen to have studied Latin, mm -hmm. so I started to read, why are they not translating this in German? And I'll tell you why. <laughs> because the rabbis were discussing there how a woman should seduce her husband in the bedroom. <laughs> and they didn't dare to translate that into German. So to put it into the Latin, because they thought nobody will read Latin. <laughs> <laughs> For a small fee, I will tell you where <laughs> I <laughs> <am. laughs> But this is marvelous, the Talmud. A moment after they have told the woman how she should deduce her husband, they go back to a legal discussion, and then they jump into tefillah, and from there they go to all sorts of different places. You don't know, you know, you have to really hold your cup, as they say, to hold out under those discussions because this is totally abnormal by standards of, for example, Greek philosophy. I studied Greek philosophy, I have a PhD in philosophy. There's nothing like that in philosophy because everything is worked out there very carefully, step by step, logic, after logic, building up arguments, very beautiful. In the Talmud that doesn't happen. You know why? Because the Talmud is interested in one thing, not in philosophy. It is interested in life. And it knows that life <coughs> has to do with sexuality, and it has to do with tefillah, and it has to do with damages, and on the end of the day, the Talmud is of the opinion that they are all related. Sex is related to tefillah, my dear friends. And also a lecture, I will tell you about this. <laughs> but it is true. <coughs> then they speak about kavana, about intention with tefillah. And then they move again to international law. Marvelous. Nothing of that can be found in any other literature in the world. And therefore, the Talmud became my great love in life because it was life which it was discussing, not just law. Because law can never, ever completely take over life or completely understand what life is all about. Law is a danger because life is much broader and larger than any law system, including the halakha, is able to cover. Ask any judge, a Jewish or a Gentile judge, in a Beit Din, in a Beit Mishpat, what is his or her biggest problem? The answer is how to apply the law to a specific case when the case does not fit the law. And there you get into trouble, and that's the reason why among big and famous judges there are enormous differences of opinion. Not because they do not know the law, they know the law very well, but they realize one thing, life does not cover, or better, the law does not cover life. This is what makes the Talmud so great. It speaks about inner life. It speaks about feelings. It speaks about sentiment. It speaks about harkashot, as we say in Hebrew. These rabbis were farmers. They were business people. They were shopkeepers. They were judges. And therefore, they knew life. And therefore, they knew how to understand halacha. Life itself, nothing less than that. Chaotic? Why? Why is the Talmud chaotic? For one good reason, my friends. You and my life is totally chaotic. <laughs> we try to put some seder and order into all this. And we should do that, otherwise it gets totally out of hand. But we all know quite well that the unexpected is constantly that what brings your life back to what it really is. It is chaotic. 
try to put some logic into it, try to put some Seder into it, you can try up till a point, and know that halakha does something of that, to give us a certain misgaret in which we can live, so that it does not become totally impossible, but to deny that it is chaotic is completely missing the boat. That's, by the way, the reason why the rabbis, you all know this expression, say about all Talmudical stages or sages and about the Talmudic observations, Elu ve Elu difre Elokim Chayim. These and those are the words of the living God. If the sages disagree, there is one point which is not understood properly. When they agree and they have good reasons why they have their opinions, and it is based somewhere within the halakha, within the Torah, then these are the words of God, even when they contradict each other. It is not that Beit Shammai is wrong and Beit Hillel is right. They're both right. There's only one problem. Who are we going to follow? Because you can't follow them both at the same time. You can't light the candles for Hanukkah from 8 till 1 and from 1 till 8 at the same time. So in the end, we have to make some kind of order in all this, which is what sometimes the Talmud does. By the way, most of the time it doesn't even do that. It leaves it up to the later generations to work this out. And therefore, you have many differences of opinion also in the later generations, because they realize one thing. All these traditions, all these contradictions is what life is all about. And only conformity, because we need a Jewish community and we need to go to Bet Knesset, so there must be some conformity. We will have to decide in according to Beit Hillel, but not because Beit Shammai is wrong. Or that Rava and Abaya, when they are having their discussions in the Talmud, one of them is wrong. No, the whole point is all of them are right, as long as they are rooted within this tradition going back to the days of Sinai. I read you a fantastic statement made by the Marashal. Rabbi Shlomo Luria, 16th century, Kabbalist, tremendous thinker. He writes like this, I quote in English. You find, will find it in the book. One should never be astonished by the range of debate and argumentation in matters of halakha. All these views are in the category of Elu ve Elu Divrei Elohim Chayim. The Kabbalist explained that the basis for this is that each individual soul, here it is, each individual neshama was present, present at Sinai and received the Torah by means of, this is symbolic, the 49 tzimorot, the 49 kinds of spiritual challenges, the channels. Each, here it is, each one perceived the Torah from his own perspective, in accordance to his intellectual capacity, as well as the nature and uniqueness of his particular soul. One felt like this, and one felt like that. Thus the sages de declared in a debate among the scholars, all positions articulated are different forms of the same truth. Like when the sunlight comes down to us, it breaks up in different colors, but it originally comes into one color when you go, I would go to the sun itself, so it is with the Torah. And now comes his most important point, and that is this, when we speak about Torah, or when we speak about the door, the generation which received the Torah, we have to realize that they were not just passive recipients, they were not. Because the way how it came down to them was fire their personalities. And each personality was different. And therefore each one heard something else. You know, there's even observation I won't go into now because it will take too long, where it says that the only thing what the Jews heard at Sinai was the alf of the word Anochi. I am the Lord your God who took you out of Egypt. They only heard the alf. Has anybody of you ever heard an alf? There's no way of hearing it off. <laughs> Unless you put a kamez and a zegol under it, you can't pronounce it. So the rabbi was actually saying something like this. They didn't hear a thing. What they heard was inside, in their neshama, what God was trying to tell them. And obviously this is far from an easy topic. 
of what the Taryak mitzvot of the 613 commandments were all about. But there are no passive recipients. And therefore, you really cannot fix halacha. All what you can do is to do that, what that halacha means to you. That doesn't mean to say that you and I can choose. It just means to say that you have to somehow get into the neshama together with the whole of the Jewish tradition and make it to speak to yourself in a way that it speaks to you like it does not speak to anybody else. Yes, conformity. We sometimes have to give up certain things. Why? Because otherwise we can't live as a community. But we are paying a price for it. One of the great Hasidic thinkers was the Meha Shiloach. The Meha Shiloach used to say, there are mitzvot in the Torah, midoraita, which even make the point that they perhaps have no meaning to some people. They're meaningless. So why do I have to keep them if they don't do anything to me? So the Meha Shiloach, great Hasidic, very unusual thinker, says the only reason why I keep that mitzvah is because of my neighbor, because he needs to keep it. <laughs> Not because I get anything out of it. And that is a very profound statement to make. And let me very quickly, for the few minutes we still have, to understand the following. Maimonides, who was a genius of all geniuses, and when he wrote this Mishneh Torah, which we all studied, basically did a disservice to the Jewish tradition. Why? Because he codified it. And that is not possible. The same thing is true with the Shulchan Aruch, a fantastic work, no doubt about it. But he codified it. And if you ask the question, why is it that they codified it, I tell you why that is. Very clearly so, and I discussed that in great lengths. The reason is, because when we Jews were living in the Galut, in exile, we needed to codify Jewish law because we had one very big problem, and that is, how do we survive Galut? How do we survive exile? And we can only do that when we codify things, we call living conformity, we create big walls around us, so to keep the non-Jews out and to make sure that we survive this terrible condition called Galut. And that's the reason why Maimonides wrote the Mishneh Torah, and by the way, this is also the reason, not to go into this now, why he wrote the Yud Gimel Ikarim, the, f the 13 principles of Jewish faith, of which I would say, I'm not so sure that even Maimonides himself believed in all of them, at least not the way in which he writes them. But he did that because Galut required that. But now comes the point, and I'm not the first one to say this, the man who wrote in great lengths about it was Rabbi Eliezer Berkowitz, in his book about Halakha, where he makes the point that is all nice and good as long as you're living in Galut. But the moment you go back to Eretz Israel and you start the state of Israel, we don't need these walls anymore. We don't need to be constantly afraid of what the Goyim are saying and doing to us. We have a strong army and we can somehow look after ourselves by now. And so Rabbi Eliezer Berkowitz correctly says, let's undo this. Let's decodify, decodify. Because the Jewish tradition and halakha has been in a waiting mode for the last 2,000 years to <coughs> wait for the moment to get out of it. It was defensive halakha, he says. And now we need to change that because if we don't, we will make the state of Israel in a piece of galut and living in a ghetto, which we are at this moment, no doubt, doing. Now, I discuss that in great lengths in my book and with many examples, and I also suggest in there how we can change that. And this is not Reform Judaism, and it's not Conservative Judaism. I believe that is Orthodox Judaism. If we just miss or differently understand the word orthodoxy, which, as I said before, is a most terrible mistake. One more point, and that's it. Take one case, take two cases. The railway road. A major problem, I wrote about that in the book as well. The problem here is, <coughs> what should be the case with the, with the state of Israel? Is the state becoming the means to economy, or is economy becoming the means to the survival and the happiness of the state? Mm. That's really what this discussion is all about. 
How to deal with that? You can read about it in the book. <laughs> Another example is indeed democracy on one side and the Jewish tradition on the other side. Remember one thing, my dear friends. Nobody in Jewish history ever thought about the possibility that there would be a secular Jewish state. Nobody ever mentions this. Not Maimonides, nobody else. If Maimonides speaks about the Jewish state, he speaks about the messianic stage, state. When a Mashiach has come, then it will look like this and that. Nobody ever thought about what you and I at this moment experience, a secular Jewish state. The only person I can think of who did understand the possibility of that was Rabbeinu Nissim, the Ram, the famous great Talmudic sage in Spain many hundreds of years ago, who indeed discusses the way, and he was no doubt influenced by the Spanish condition who had similar problems of how to bring religion together with democracy, or at that time it was not yet called democracy, but some kind of input on the side of the population. And he finds an answer to that, again, discussed in the book in great lengths, but I don't know about anybody else who discussed that. When Rabbi Herzog, the first chief rabbi of Israel, tremendous Tommy Chacham, wrote about this problem, and he said, how are we going to do this? A Jewish state, a democratic state, where halakha not only influences the state, but should be the final arbiter, the final one to decide on matters like that. He said, remember one thing. For the last 2,000 years, Halakha has never dealt with a Jewish state. And therefore, we didn't develop it. We are far behind the times. And now he, as he was also, by the way, a tremendous legal thinker, said, we better do something about that. And he had his own ways, and also people had different ways of doing that. They realized that. There's only one problem. With all respect, the chief rabbinate of today has no clue. Forgive me for saying so. It has no clue. Mm -hmm. I've been calling together with quite a few other rabbis that the chief rabbinate should come to an end. And we should do everything to make it happen. Because if we don't, we will continue to live in a ghetto mm -hmm. with an out-fashioned, old-fashioned, outdated halakha which will not respond to the needs of the great times. One last thing, and it is this. To be religious means to live in amazement. To live in wonder, to walk around in this world and say, wow, how is it possible? A flower, a little sipor, a little uh, bird, anything else, look into, the, into the, in your mirror and look to yourself and say, wow, how did that happen? <laughs> From a little seed, which developed in nine months, nobody knows how to explain that, we know exactly what happens. But science has no clue about how explaining why this happens. You and I are living in a total wonder, in total amazement. We're living in a tremendous nest. The state of Israel is one huge, incredible miracle from beginning to end. I always say to those people I argue with who are atheists, and they say, no, it's all automatic, it's all part of evolution. Then I say, you are bigger believers than I am. <laughs> and I tell you why. You believe that this is all by accident? I am too skeptical to believe that. <laughs> and they don't know what to say about it. They wait a moment. You are the skeptical one, and I'm not the skeptical one. I said, yes, you believe in something which requires such belief. I'm not prepared to go that way because I can't believe as much as you do. <laughs> My dear friends, there's much more to be said about the topic, but much of it is written in the book which I just published. I thank you very much for all this. I thank you again, Ilana, for making this possible. And I hope you will continue to live as great, deeply religious Jews, but a little different perhaps than we are doing at this moment. And I'm speaking to myself as well, because it is high time that we wake up. It's not commonplace. Let us be disturbed. Let us be aware that the Jewish tradition is one big Protestant movement. <laughs> I don't mind to give some answers to questions. I don't know what the order of the day is, but Makasha. Can we ask questions? Makasha, but then everybody else will be quiet. Can we ask questions? Yeah. There are questions for those who want to listen to them. It's just a. Uh, uh,
interrogatory intervention. I received this week from a friend in. Uh, I received this week from a friend in London uh, a message saying that there'd been a Beni Mitzvah recently for a 14-year-old girl who'd come out who didn't want to do a binary bat mitzvah or bar mitzvah. And so she did this at 14 years old. And uh, I don't know what the tendency of the rabbi who, um, who presided over this was, obviously not orthodox and certainly not Haredi, but what should be the position? And I'm not taking a position myself on this. I'm just, it's, it's an interesting question that I want to ask you is what should be, not should be, what, how do we deal with this new age progressive tendency in orthodoxy nevertheless vis-a-vis um, -vis these sort of questions? What is your opinion on this? Well, I believe, I mean, you are asking me on a specific case. Yes, I am. There are loads of similar cases like that. Obviously, the question about homosexuality, change of gender, and things like that. There is now <coughs> some, some discussion going on within the Orthodox world about this, more than it has ever been, because it was basically ignored. But now that it all comes to the open, I cannot answer your question specifically because I don't know the details. I would love to hear them. If you can send that to me, I would like to know that. But let me something, say something very controversial. The question about homosexuality, which is related to all these matters, and the isur in the Torah of homosexual relationships, may quite well only apply to heterosexual people. I hope you get me. But wait, we're not talking about, I'm not talking about homosexuality, I'm talking about what is now called non-binary. I don't Neither know what male means. nor female. How, do, how, how does the alacha, how should the alacha deal with a non-binary relationship that is neither homosexual or heterosexual, but is trying to well, go towards the, this non-gendered specificity? In the Talmud, there is discussion about that, <coughs> about um, a, a child which is not born with not with the sexual organs yes, of a man yeah, or okay, women. Yeah. And then there's a long discussion going on about where do they belong, right? And it would take me too long now to explain you how that all works. But it is there. The rabbis did see the possibility to that. Now the question is, what are we going to do? Are we going to deny that and to say, you know, we don't want to discuss that because the slippery slope argument is if we allow this, then tomorrow we have to allow that, which I think is a very wrong way of looking to things, because if you don't take risks, you are not able ever to solve any of these problems. And it may be that sometimes you're shooting in the wrong direction, you pay the price for it, absolutely true. But that's true about any kind of legal system. So it is all there. But the main question here is, how are we reading the Talmud? Because if we read the Talmud with certain preconditional attitudes, which doesn't allow the Talmud really to say what it's actually saying, then we are ignoring part of it, and we do as if nothing has happened. While in fact the Talmud was prepared to open up any discussion about anything, even when we don't like it. But I dare to say that today, and I know what I'm speaking about, the way in which the Talmud is being taught is very often wrong. Why? Because we take the text for what it says. We don't look behind the text. We don't look between the words. We don't understand the music, what is being tried to be conveyed there. And therefore, we are missing many opportunities which would probably answer questions like your particular case. Thank you. What is your advice on What are your, like, what is your advice? How do we teach our children? What halakhas do we, like, how do we know the halakha? Wait, if, if everything that we have is from Galut, we don't really have a way forward, how do we deal with our lives now? And, like, it's sort of in transition. It's not an easy 
question to answer because we are in the middle of this new development which has not yet been tried out enough to be able to give a proper answer to that. The first issue is to keep on asking questions. The second important issue is to keep on learning. Learning, Talmud, whatever else it is, but also to think about what it says. Not in the way as it is being taught in the yeshivot most of the time, and just accepting what our teacher says, and therefore it must be halachale Moshe Messina, as we say. No, you have to think about it, you will. And very often, and I do that as well, on the end you are left with a doubt, and if you live in a doubt, you will have to make a decision because you cannot always live in a doubt itself. And then you have to take the risk. I will, for the meantime, do it like this, till perhaps one day I will find another answer, and then I will do it like that. That is also behind, by the way, you know, if you look to Beit Shammai Beit Hillel, it's very clear from the Talmud that after the Talmud says that we should go in according to Beit Hillel, Beit Shammai continued to do their own way. They didn't give up on their individuality. And we should take that as an example. So there are certain things, if you feel that you need to change them, but never for conformity or never for making life easier, but because of more and greater amount of authenticity, then you can do that. But it often means that you are up to a wall and you don't know yet what to do. You will have to make a decision between A or B. So take one which speaks the most of you and perhaps later on you will have to change your mind. Life is chaotic. Yeah. Rabbi, with the uh, demise or the lessening of reform, I'm an American, just making out of And I think continually of the 15 million people that we are in the world against a population of 7 billion people. With the demise and the assimilation going on in America, I'm very well aware of it, <coughs> family and so forth. What holds for the truth, orthodoxy, is that the answer? Conservatism was once for a time. Reform is a new, was an opportunity. What is the determination that I have to listen and understand what means to be an Orthodox Jew uh, in this world that we're dealing with so we can live for another 400 years? You mentioned 400 years. The chapel's 400 years. This is 400 years. 400 years comes up a lot. But I'm perplexed by this as we my wife and I came here, and we live a different life. And it's kind of nice. But I think continually of America. It's, their population there is going to drop from six and a half million to four soon. What do we have to live for with only 10 million Jews in the world against seven billion? It's not a game. This has nothing to do with numbers. This is all to do with the quality of our lives as Jews. We out, we outlived all our enemies in the last 4,000 years. The Romans, the Greeks, the Egyptians, the Germans, right? Speaking in logical terms, that should not have been possible. And we did. Which proves that there is something about us, and we should not walk around like that, but we should just take the responsibility for that, is of, we are a very strange heaven. <laughs> <laughs> and the way how we manage to survive all that, what they all tried to do against us, was for one reason. We hold on to the Jewish tradition. Now, if you are going to ask me what exactly is the Jewish tradition, then I will answer you, I have no clue. <laughs> <laughs> and that is exactly how it should be, because it means to say it is a flexible concept which moves here, left to right, right to left, up there, go down there. There are certain borderlines, they are there. Nobody knows exactly what these borderlines are, because if I start to look into the commentaries and for all the Jewish philosophers and so on, I see that they all had their own borderline, and they all realized that it was relative, and it was not forever, it was for the moment in which we live, and that was exactly the power by which we were able to hold out and survive the impossible. So if you were asking me, you want to get 
for me a squared in miscarried or what the Jewish tradition is, then I say, forgive me for saying this, go to Christianity. We don't have this. Baruch Hashem. <laughs> we are a living tradition, it moves, which goes this way and then it goes that way, it makes a mistake here and we will try to be metakenet, as we say, we start to make it better on the other side. This is the way how the Jewish tradition has worked because it is dealing with life and not with philosophy and not with mathematics. It is something much larger than that and that is its very beauty. That Shabbat is very important about this. Eating kosher is very important about that. Taharata Mishpacha is very important about that. Yes, these are the fundamentals. But exactly how all of that works, just as I don't know, if I speak about God, and I speak every day to God, I have not the slightest clue to whom I'm speaking. Because it is totally beyond me. I do believe there is something going on there. I also believe that about the Jewish tradition, there is something going on there. There is a certain very flexible, elastic framework taking place, and I'm a little pie piece in there where I try to live my life as far as I can do. And the first and most important thing is I keep on studying this Jewish tradition. I keep on struggling with it. I don't have to agree with everything what it says over there. This is what it does. You can't bring the whole of the Jewish tradition back only to Halakha. But halakha plays an important point. But the big question now is, what kind of halakha are we speaking about in the new conditions of the state of Israel? So I'm sorry that I can't answer you in the way as you would like to have it on a silver plate. But be aware, Baruch Hashem, we don't have that silver plate. Hmm. But I think there's something more than just Jewish traditions, a question of Jewish identity, which... I was surprised, actually, just looking through your index, that you only mentioned Levinas once, and I'm sure you are in dialogue with Levinas more than once in your own life. And uh, having translated Levinas's Talmudic lectures, and if you don't read French, then you probably have read it um, beyond the verse. Uh, Levinas says, does he not, that Jewish identity, particularly after the war, is not a question of Yuda stamped in your in your papers, but Jewish identity is Tanakh, Mishnah, and Talmud. And without that, there is no Jewish identity. And so it's not a question of Jewish tradition of Minagin. It's textual based. What is your take on that? I'm not hundred percent sure I agree with that, to okay. be quite honest. I don't think it's completely textual based. I think it has a lot to do with also feelings within the Jewish community which are not put into that text, cannot be put into that text, which plays a role there as well. And I'm not even sure that uh, Levinas is making the point it is only depending on the text, because if I read his works and I read between the lines, which I did, I see that there is much more going on there than what he actually writes. Um, texts plays an important role, but the music behind the text plays perhaps an even more important role. Jewish identity, yes, absolutely. What that Jewish identity is, I don't know. I only know one thing, halakha does play a very important role in it, right? And I think that we are now in a situation where slowly but surely we start to see that there may be forms of Jewishness which no longer fit into the traditional understanding of halakha and therefore the halakha now needs to rethink that so that does it does not lose the Jewish identity issue but somehow combines it with its own understanding of some other matters. But that's a long difficult talk. Can you say something? Last question because I'm told I have to stop. Can you say something about um, the balance between Minhag Avatenu Biadeno and innovation? Minak Avotenu Biadenu, which means to say that we have customs which we have created over the years, they can only continue for the future if they are at least at the same time still meaningful to us today. If they are not at all meaningful or they do the opposite, then there is no point anymore in keeping them. Unless you want to argue, which is not completely without foundation, and that is to say that if it is such an old minhak and this is the way we Jews do it, 
so we continue to do it because we are Jews, right? <laughs> Which is an argument, I'm not sure if I buy into that yes or no, but I think also even rabbinical law, there are certain laws there which don't any longer work. Mm -hmm. And I'm just arguing in this book, mm -hmm. so let's or create also rabbinical laws or do away with these particular rabbinical laws. We have to be very careful how to do that. It's not an easy thing to do. Yes, what, right? is, the, what is the But, but, but you know, that, that's, and I discussed that in great lengths. It needs to be done, but you have to be very careful because you are work, walking on Adama Kodesh, on holy stuff, on holy grounds, and uh, you can't just do this. This is one of my objections against the reform, at least the old reform. I'm not sure that's today anymore true, where this was too quickly done without thinking enough about what the implications of that are. I thank you very much, all of you. To Daraba. If you want emails for those, please fill in. And I will be over there to sign <coughs>